everybody, it's Allison Williams here, your law firm mentor. Law Firm Mentor is a business coaching service for solo and small law firm attorneys. We help you grow your revenues, crush chaos in business, and make more money. Today's guest, Ken Hardison, is known as the millionaire maker for a reason. He has helped lawyers across the country triple and quadruple their law practices and income by bringing them the insights, knowledge, and critical strategies of legal marketing and management that can only be learned in the trenches of real law firm success. With over 30 years of legal experience, Ken has personally grown and sold two seven-figure law firms and has shared his knowledge and experience with attorneys, helping them experience exponential growth, increased profits, and ethical market preeminence. So I'm really excited that today we have uh, the guest, Ken Hardison of PILMA. And for those of you that don't know what PILMA stands for, I don't know where you have been. You must be under a rock to not know about the organization. But essentially, uh, PILMA has been an innovator in helping law firms, in particular in the personal injury space, right? It's not solely for personal injury attorneys, but that's what Ken's uh, practice area was. So that was uh, his claim to fame, if you will. And in his work with PILMA, he has been able to take lawyers from just starting out struggling, hustling into the stratosphere of law firm success. So PILMA, for those of you that don't know, stands for Powerful Innovative Legal Marketing and Management Association. So that's P-I-L-M-M-A. And we had a great talk today about a lot of different topics of, of law firm growth. And we spent a lot of time talking about team and about cash flow. So I want you to really dial in today listening to our episode, but Think about the strategies that you can use today in your law firm to make your law firm a success. And if you have any questions about how you can get a hold of Ken, that information is going to be in our show notes. But I'm really excited to uh, share with you this conversation because it was very enlightening and uh, very entertaining. All right, enjoy. All right, Ken Hardison, welcome to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really happy to have you here, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit starstruck um, just having you here in my studio because, you know, you've had such a, a pro- profound impact through Pilma, your company, in helping lawyers to grow law firms, which is, of course, what we do, but we do it in a different sector, and we also have some overlap in our philosophical beliefs, but, of course, the more people that have access to people that know what we're doing, like you and I do, the better we're able to help the community. So, Without further ado, I want to dive into what I think is the sexy topic of the day, what you know a lot about because you've helped a lot of people with this, which is how to scale a law firm. So we know that lawyers often get in their own way and there are a lot of barriers to growing a law firm. So why don't you tell us what you think the, the top three barriers are to growing a law firm? Okay. Well, number one, uh, believe it or not, is uh, le- lack of leadership. And uh, and it starts at the top with you. Uh you know, if you don't have a vision or a plan, uh, then how can your people get you where you want to go if you don't share it with them? And you've got to be a coach and get really good people and coach them to be better than they were yesterday and be better tomorrow than they are today. And then the other big deal is, is not having the right uh, people. Um, uh, you can no, no great law firm was ever built on the back of average staff i can tell you that and, and the deal is people uh make the excuse that well i just can't afford to, you know the a players but but the deal is the a players will do three times as much work you can pay them one and a half times what you're playing your average players or staff and they'll you'll still come out ahead <laughs> uh yeah, but it's but it's hard for people to see that um you know and then i think that the 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 third thing is um is cash flow, lack of cash flow. Uh, and that's uh, my big stand on that is uh, revenue is for vanity, net, net profits is for sanity, but cash flow is king or queen. And, and, and you know, but, but the big deal overall is here, here's what I see happen. As you get bigger and bigger, things get more complex. And what I mean, like, I'll make this very elementary, uh, maybe too simple. You got two kids playing together, everything's okay. You put a third one in there, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. But you've only increased it by one person, but it, it creates total chaos, as you, as you know. 
and, and the more the bigger you get, the more people you had, the more complex it gets, and the less the the more you got to be structured and you know with the processes and systems and all those things you know that you know very well, and so that kind of a that's a big barrier because then you got to have you got to be organized and. and Lawyers, just like doctors, tend not to be organized when it comes to their business. I mean, you know, they don't have the infrastructure uh, set up to handle the complexities of a bigger firm. That is, that is, there's so much insight there. I mean, the, the fact of talking about the complexity and how complexity grows as you grow people is very true. And that's the reason why when people apply those $100,000 strategies to their $500,000 law firm or those $500,000 strategies to their $2 million law firm, everything, you know, just collapses under the weight of the ineptitude. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, that's the three barriers as I see them. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned team and, I, you know, we, we actually uh, coming up uh, in, in Law for Mentor, we have a, a whole retreat on, on, on optimizing your team. So I love to talk about getting the right players in and you uh, spoke very eloquently about not being able to build a, a top quality law firm on the backs of mediocre people, right? So talk to us a little bit about team. Like what is the key to hiring and retaining that A plus staff that's gonna really get the job done for growing a firm? Well, everybody says, you know, hire slow and fire fast. That's, that's, that's pretty much, uh, you know, everybody knows that saying. But, but I think it goes, uh, I think when you, what I think you need to do first is look what the cost of a bad hire is. <laughs> And if and it's not just their salary while you were paying them, it's the time it took to train them, it's the time it takes to replace them, it's the time to train the new person that you're replacing. Uh, so when you do that, it's not just you know I've had people tell me anywhere from two times to fifteen times a salary. I think it's probably somewhere around two or three times a person's salary to replace them. So why would you want to go out there and hire somebody that you know is going to fail? Uh, you know, or you don't know that they're going to be an A player. And so what you got to do is you can't, um, most people when they hire somebody, this, they're very reactionary. And it's, I got to get somebody to fill this slot. I got to get somebody to fill the slot. Well, let me tell you the last person I hired for Pilma, which was like a month ago, five months, mm -hmm. took us five months. Mm -hmm. We interviewed, we, we, a lot of people and we uh, did a lot of testing and we go through this whole onboarding. Uh, there's a guy named Brad Smart and Jeff Smart Brothers, I think. And they got this uh, book called Onboarding. But but the whole big deal is you've got to really, we, we use scorecards and everything, and you really want to figure out what the person's skill set is. And you really got people, I think the biggest problem, people don't interview, right? What I'm saying to employers, because a lot of people on the employee side knows know how to interview. But, but here's, I, I, if there's one takeaway from the day about hiring, when you hire them, you know, get them to give you their last five jobs and then ask them these two questions and this will get right to the meat. Uh, and go through each job and say, okay, what would, who was your immediate supervisor and what would they say were your biggest strengths and your biggest weaknesses? And then and go through each one of them. And then after you ask that question, and now, are you willing to sign a release so that I can talk to that person and give me the phone number? Because I do want to talk to them, but I am going to follow up. And if they him haul around or if they give it to you and then they, they, they go AWOL, you know there's problems, right? <laughs> but but the deal is, most people don't even, I mean, I've had lawyers that don't even do background checks and then hire criminals, you know, uh, or people with warrants out for their arrest for embezzlement. Um you know, you'd just be surprised. Uh, so, I mean, you've got to do your due diligence just like you, you're doing it. If you were going to invest $100,000 in a stock or something, I don't think you just pick the first one. You would do a due diligence. So you got to do due diligence in your hiring. You know, you got to look at it like you're, I hate to say it, but you got to look like you're purchasing something that's worth, you know, a lot of money to you because it is. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to make a bad buy, right? And so you've got to do these things, you know, do a, a background check, you know. Uh, you know, uh, my God. Um, and, and then what I think the other deal is when you hire them, you can't just throw them in there and let them sink or swing, swim. And that's where, you know, you got to have your, you need systems and processes. That, and that makes it so much easier to, uh, to onboard somebody, you know, to train somebody. 
because uh, one of my old old mentor to mentors told me if somebody's not performing, it's usually you. It's your fault that you didn't train them properly. Hmm. You know, it's not their fault. But but you got to get the right person in there too. You know what I'm saying. But but a lot of times it's it's your fault. It's not their fault because you didn't train them properly. Uh, and then the problem is, people say I don't have time. But the deal is, you know, what's worse, uh, you know, keeping them and not training them. I mean, you know, <laughs> think about it. I mean, that's 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 crazy. So I mean, the deal is, that's one of your biggest resources. And, and so you know, you want to to look at it as an investment and not um, make bad hires and don't be a guessing game. You know, we do a lot of testing and, and not just the disc and different things. I, I do this test that I use from a guy out of Raleigh, North Carolina for 12 years. It's called real, Hi real talent hiring. Yeah. I don't, Jay Henderson, I don't get anything from him, but I was in a mastermind with him many years ago and met him in Raleigh. I'm from Raleigh. I had my law firm was in Raleigh. So we got to be friends. And we were both Dan, Dan Kennedy followers and things like that, who is a great marketer. And so I've been using his test. I don't hire anybody without them taking that test. I wait till I get the final two or three, and then they take the test, and then I talk to him. And he always guides me right. 98% of the time, I'm not going to say 100%, but 98% of the time, he's right, and I'm wrong. Um, so, yeah, that's that's the big deal about hiring is uh, – People just don't put enough into it. I mean, and they, they, they're too lackadaisical about it. They're, they're too lazy. I mean, you really, really, and they try to fill it way too fast. I mean, it's such, so important. Yeah, so a lot of great things there. First of all, shout out to Jay Henderson. He is a friend of law firm mentor, and we use his hiring assessment as well. And I recommend it. I recommend it not universally, uh, but I tell everyone, you know, all the other assessments out there, they're never going to give you as much as this one gives you about how people manage themselves, manage others, and manage tasks. And the information is just critical. Now, one of the things you said that I love, which is this idea of people being bad at interviewing, because one of the things that I see lawyers do all the time is they take someone's word for it, that they're going to be good on their feet, that they're going to write good motions, that, you know, even if you ask someone who is a reference and say, you know, tell me about this person's writing skill. Tell me about this person's arguing skill. How do they try cases? You're still getting a perspective. You're not getting your perspective. You're getting someone else's perspective. So what if they happen to work for a lawyer that's a B lawyer and you are an A lawyer looking to hire a talent? Well, the B lawyer is going to say they're great, but then you're going to see them and you're going to say, oh my God, what did I bring into my law firm? So I always tell lawyers, you know, you need to put them to the test while they're there. You know, I don't ever hire a lawyer to work in my law firm without having them cross-examine somebody in a role play during the examination, you know, during the interview. I want to see what you got. Right. And I don't want to see it after you've had months or years to prepare for it. I want to see it on the fly. Yeah. You know, and the other thing I used to do, and I've never really talked about this a lot, but especially I used to hire a lot of lawyers out of law school. And, and there's two different trains of thoughts on that but but i liked it because uh i let them work there in the summer and then i see if they were a good fit culturally for our for our firm and i had to hire a few with experience but i wanted them to learn it my way even though maybe my ways you know my way is my way you know mm -hmm. i think it's the best it might not be but i think it is and i'm writing a check so you're going to do it my way right <laughs> absolutely uh, but but i used to ask these questions when i was interviewing these law students because I was trying to figure out, you know, number one, would they be able to relate to my clients? And number two, do they have the work ethic? Do they know what work is? And so I would ask them questions of like, hey, did you work during summer in high school? Did you work part-time when you were in high school, college, you know? you know?" And then I would ask them this question. And this has been 20, 20 years ago, I'd say, had you rather make uh, work 40 hours and make 60,000 or work 60 hours and make 100,000? And, and believe it or not, over half of them would say 40 hours and make 60. And, you <laughs> know, right. and so, Next. <laughs> you know, and that's the ones I didn't hire, right? Because I wanted somebody that was hungry. Uh, yeah. And what is it? John Morgan says you can't teach hungry. Um, you know, you either got it or you don't. Uh, you know, and so I, I feel like too, if they've worked in public jobs, you know, and most times they work in the summer or whatever, they work jobs with dealing with people, average people, you know, uh, 
And so they get to know how to deal with people on a, on a, on a basis, on a one-to-one -one basis. And they got some skills on dealing with people and, and service and client service. Uh, so I always ask those type of questions. I felt like they were good questions. I, you know, I hired some really good hires and they turned out to be great lawyers. Uh, you know, uh, I sold out 10 years ago, but there's lawyers that I hired, believe it or not, 85% uh, of them are still there. Um, so that tells me I, uh, I was okay in how I did it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I had a couple of them. I know a couple left and started their own law firm, but that's just part of being real hungry, right? I mean, you're going to lose some. That's okay. If somebody can better themselves, I got no problem with it. As long as they treat me fair and don't try to steal mm -hmm. money from me, I got, I'll, I'll help them. I'll send them business. Mm -hmm. If they try to screw me, of course, then we got a different problem, right? You know? Right. I'm going after you, juggler. <laughs> <laughs> that's business. I mean, that's business. I mean, I'll give you the shirt off my back, but you try to take something from me, you know, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. Ten times. Ten times. That's just the way I do business. Yeah. Well, if you had 85% of your lawyers stay, you're doing far better than average because the ABA reports that on average lawyers turn every four years. So yeah. if you're keeping your team, that means you're not just getting good people, but you're treating them right and you're creating a culture where they want to stay. So they yeah. recognize that the risk of leaving is never going to be worth the, the loss of what they what they would leave behind. Yeah, which brings me, I want to, I want to say this, because this is, I got a lot of sayings, and I'm going to write a book about them one day, but I, what I'm, one of mine is, the way you treat your staff is the way your staff's going to treat your clients. Oh, and I've always really, true. I've already, I've always really believed that. And, and, and another good deal about keeping these people is, it ain't the money, Yes, they, they, don't, they want affirmation and, and feel appreciated. And if you don't do that, you're not going to keep them up. You know, they say the number one reason people quit is they got to ask for an immediate supervisor. The second one is they just don't feel appreciated or, you know, that, that, that they're, they're valued. And then the third one is they don't see room for advancement. And then fourth one is money. It's not, money is not, everybody thinks money. I mean, I think it might be whatever, but if you're getting really good people, that's not going to be the reason they leave you. Yeah. It's going to be either their immediate supervisor or they, most of them, it's just, they don't feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and that was a problem for me when I first started because I felt like I was paying them good. And right, I didn't, that's, that's the appreciation, right? And I didn't need, I, I didn't need the affirmation. I, I didn't dislike it, but I, I, I didn't thirst for it. Uh, you know, I didn't have a, a yearning for it. I, I felt very confident, I guess, in myself that, but, but a lot, 90% of people need it. I mean, yeah. and I didn't understand that. And I had a mentor that, in fact, my office administrator, this is how she got me to doing it. She created a happy, uh, happy, some stamps. One of them was a happy face. Another one was great job. Uh, and, and then when the people would send me stuff, I'd stamp it and send it back to them, my paralegals, because I just won't, you know, I won't good at it. But now I've got a lot better at it. That's something you can learn. You know, I, I really try to go out of my way to, uh, to do shout outs to people in front of their peers, you know, and then, you know, when you got to jump on them, you do it in private, you don't embarrass them, you know, um, but you got, you know, if you want to build a great firm, you've got to have really good people and, and you've really got to be a coach. You don't manage people. You need to coach them. What they say a great leader is somebody that will help somebody, you know, grow to be another leader. And, and, and I think that's true. And so I'm always trying to figure out, how I can help my people uh, become better, you know, and find out what their what their goals are, what what's their dreams, and try to help them get there. Yeah. Why not? Well, Ken, I really appreciate your being so candid about not necessarily being the at a boy, at a girl type person, because the reality is most entrepreneurs aren't, right? Most of us had the grit, the gut to get there on our own, and we don't understand the mindset of the people who need that affirmation, that positive reinforcement. And you mentioned Dan Kennedy earlier. One of the books that I give out at uh, our Marketing for the Masters retreat is the No BS Ruthless Management of People in Profits book. And in it, he tells a story about the 100 people starting on day one, five of them get promoted and are then required to manage the other 95. And their answer is, well, how do I do that? All right? I didn't, need, I didn't need like a checklist or, you know, a spreadsheet or, you know, 15 different cheerleading, you know, mantras for me to get the job done. You gave me a job, you gave me the tools, I got the job done. But you at the top 5% are not the other 95. 
and you cannot create your policies and your systems and your procedures in your law firm as if everyone is going to be another version of you because they're not. Mm-hmm. If they were another version of you, they'd have their own law firm. I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. That was hard for me to learn, though. That was probably that was one of my biggest obstacles of, of really of management, you know. And I'm, I'll be honest with you, I, I know what, how to manage. I just don't really like it. You know, <laughs> it's so I've always, you know, I could teach it, but uh, I've always hired real strong managers in my businesses, people that were really strong. And uh, I, I really, I didn't like abdicate it, but I delegated a lot of it. And I just kind of, I managed the managers. Right, but that's the brilliance of it. Like you, you knew it well enough to know what you didn't do well and what yeah. you were likely never going to do exceptionally well, right? You could get better at it, but it was never going to be your jam. But then you right. hired the right people so that they could be in their zone of genius doing the work that you don't want to do. Yeah, I think I think this too. Uh, this is when I think you really know that you've got a successful bi- a law firm or business is when you're in the room with your management people and you're the dumbest one. And you're going to think, what? But, but really, I mean, really, I mean, think about it. Uh, I think that's been a big part of my success is I, I, I put my, and it's hard for lawyers though, put your ego at the door and, and be brutally honest and figure out what your weaknesses are. I knew I want the best trial lawyer. I went out and hired one of the best trial lawyers I could find. I thought I was a real good negotiator. So I did a lot of mediations. Okay. I was real good at marketing. So I did a lot of our marketing. I, I did stuff that probably 98% of lawyers never do. I wrote a lot of copy. I wrote a lot of ads. I wrote a lot of commercials. I did like commercials just for like 20 years. And I, I wrote every commercial I ever did on TV. I enjoyed that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, managing a staff of, of 60. No, nah, that, that's no fun. <laughs> not to me. <laughs> not, not to me. You know what I'm saying? So, so I guess it's, uh, I, I kind of die, divulgent. I mean, you know, I'm kind of getting off track, but I don't know. I just think that you've got to hire people that are stronger than you are, that complement your weaknesses. And what you need to do is take your strengths and leverage them. Yeah. And I think that's the way you're going to be happier because whatever you're good at means you got a passion for, right? Or you wouldn't be good at it. Right. And that's going to make you happy. So do the stuff that makes you happy and you got a passion for mm-hmm. when you can afford to. I mean, I know sometimes when you start out, you got to do you got to wear it. You got to do some stuff you don't really like to do. And that's just part of life. You know, you got to crawl before you can walk, walk before you can run, you know, things like that. But the, the sooner you can get there, the more happy you're going to be. And I'll be honest with you, you'll make loads more money. You just <laughs> Isn't will. that true? I mean, you really will. I mean, that's, uh, people say, Hi, but it, it happens. I'm not telling you when I got out of cases, finally got out of cases because that was another big obstacle for me. I was so afraid that some lawyer was going to run off with my big, you know, I did PI and I, they were going to walk away with my seven figure cases. Mm-hmm. And I just held on to all the big cases right up to about the last five years I practiced. And when I finally let them go, man, I, it freed up my time and I, I could work hundred percent on my business and, and we're like double, triple my income in like yeah. the next three years. It was amazing, mm-hmm. but it was that deal. It was that hang up. I was afraid somebody's going to steal my cases, you know, because it happens a lot with PI firms. I mean, you know, they'll see a big firm, you know, you got an associate working on a big case and he says, oh, I'll just take this and I'll get a million dollar fee and I'd start my own firm. Right. You know, it's tough. It's just a tough business, PI practice sometimes. Yeah. You know, a lot of lawyers have that fear. And, and I don't, I don't really know any lawyer that I've encountered that has started a law firm that didn't at some point vocalize the what if I train them and they leave, right? You know, they don't think, what if I, what if I don't train them and they stay? Yeah, and that's think, the problem. <laughs> right, what if, I, what if I train them and they leave? Or what if I turn my head and they're, they pick themselves up and walk themselves out with my practice, yeah. you know? And, you know, that, and I tell people all the time, you know, here's the thing, you can always make more money, okay? I know it's an awful thought that your money might leave with one person, but here's the thing. Once you create a brand and you create a system for using that brand to get more clients and get more reputation and get more notoriety, you can make more money. Now, obviously there are things that you can do to protect yourself from people doing the, the, yeah. the glut and run. But, you know, I just, I had uh, one of my, one of my attorneys, he's a senior associate in my office at six years practicing, she argued before the New Jersey Supreme court because I had the reputation to get the types of cases where people would come here knowing that we would fight to the death 
in, in, a, in a practice area where people don't typically fight. And then I turned those cases over to her so that I could go be the CEO of a law firm. And right. a lot of people said to me, what are you doing? Like, you know, th- everybody wants to argue in the Supreme Court. And yeah, there was a little tinge inside me that said, do I really want to turn this over to somebody else? Like, she's got the rest of her career. You know, I only have so many more years that I'm going to be in a courtroom at all. Why would I lose that opportunity? But I looked at it like this. I get to market that opportunity, right? So I'm not marketing myself anymore. I'm marketing the firm. And I get to say the firm creates this quality. The, The firm has these people. And I have that as a marketable asset for my law firm. And it's worth more for me to market the asset of someone else than it is for me to market myself. Because if I go market myself, people then want me and I get stuck back in the weeds and my income gets limited. You know, it takes a lot to get get our egos out of our way to really think about what's best for business instead of what's best for what feels good in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. You can do some things. I, I really advocate. If, when you do a lawyer, you know, to do associate agreement that you put in there that, you know, they can't hire any of your staff mm-hmm. for like two years, you know, because what I found is a lot of clients go because of the staff, not because of the lawyer, believe it or not. Yeah, that's because, true. Because they, re, they form the relationships with the staff members, not with the lawyers. I mean, sometimes they do, but if you got a volume price, it's just no way in heck. That, I mean, you know, uh, we you can't talk to so many people. You know, uh, might be a little different with the domestic practice, I guess, but um, you know, things like that. There's certain things you know you can't have a, a non-compete because lawyer, and you can't. Clients got to write under the ethics to choose who they want to be their law firm. I mean, you know, but but yeah. I will, but I say this. Uh, I think the way to prohibit that or, or not prohibit, but to make people think twice before they walk out and, leave and try to steal cases is to, uh, when that happens, you fight hard. Like you said, you take it to Supreme Court and then they know that all the other first people in your law firm know, that Ken Hardison's crazy as hell. You know, <laughs> he probably lost $100,000 fighting this associate over these over $200,000 mm-hmm. worth of fees. And and that and it, but they, and if they know that, then they're going to be more, more likely to deal at least deal with you in a in a in a right manner, you know, in a, in a fair and equitable manner. Right. You know, and, and that's, and, that's and working out the finances. I mean, you can build in financial incentives to keep someone to stay. Yeah. You can you know you can structure in bonuses that you know that don't yeah. vest until a certain point or that it you know they get clawed back if they leave with certain you know certain circumstances yeah. but you know all of these is very state specific in fact i at one point i had employment agreements that actually talked about not not hiring out other people and even that became in in my lovely land of blue state new jersey <laughs> that became a real issue really so yeah um uh, because the whole idea was if you restrict where the employee can go or, you know, the employee could go, but the, the lawyer is barred from bringing the lawyer, bringing the staff, then that might ultimately induce that lawyer not to leave, in which case then that client doesn't have the right to go seek out that lawyer because that lawyer is now constrained with what their mobility is, which is a far stretch in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but ethics can often be a far stretch in my opinion in lots of different ways. So you have to, you have to just check the eth- ethics rules about that. I just want to give that little caveat to people, but yeah, I want to move now to talking about one of the second things that you referenced in talking about the barriers to growing a law firm. And I think it's one of the most important ones, which is cash flow, right? Yeah. Because if you don't have money, you know, cash is king. Like you said, if you don't have money. You're going to be out of business and you're going to be doing a lot of stupid things. And that's what gets lawyers disbarred. <laughs> that's what gets us you know, hanging up shop and going to work for somebody else and just not not making the best of our businesses. So let's talk about what you refer to as the seven levels of cash flow that law firm owners need to understand in order to have a successful business. Yeah. So so the deal is you've got, I mean, you can have, you know, Vernon Harness said it in his book, Scaling Up, you can have you, you can get by with average employees and you can get by with average execution and average strategy. So, but Man, cash, when that's gone, you know, you, you're dead. And that's why most small businesses don't make it, believe it or not. That's not just law firms. That's all kind of business. They're undercapitalized. And so there's two ways to do it. You've either got to go out and borrow the money, or you've got to figure out how to generate more, more cash flow. And cash flow is nothing more than how much you got in the bank at the beginning of the year, how much you got in the bank at the end of the year. And, and so 
I talk about the seven levers and one of them is price. And so these seven levers and some of them apply more to law firms and some of them more to manufacturing plants, but, but they all apply to law firms. If you can tweak a little thing at increase something 5% or 3% or 1% decrease something, you know, one or 2%. Like I, I do a presentation where you decrease two things, 1% increase one thing, 1% and you end up 19% extra uh, profit for the year and that they say how can that happen but i can show you it's gonna be hard for me to tell you oh, but i usually need a board to do that but, but let's just say price and, and this most lawyers don't charge what they should be charging and, they, and they're scared to charge more and it, the younger you are the harder it is to charge what you're really worth but but look at it this way if your fees just say an average law firm if you're taking in a half a million dollars a year in fees and you were to increase your 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 fees, whatever you charge, whether it's flat fees, hourly fees, contingency fees, if you were just to increase your fees by 10%, that would be fifty thousand dollar profit. And then if you went in and your overhead, if you, if your overhead was say like three hundred thousand, if you were to decrease that by ten percent, that would be thirty thousand. Okay, I just made you eighty thousand dollars. All right. Now, if we could increase our conversions by 10% and we're signing up uh, 20 cases a month out of uh, 100 and uh, average fees $5,000 and we could increase that 10%, that would be 22 cases. And that's just, I'm not saying that's what it should be. I'm just saying, I'm just giving you easy numbers. And that's an extra 10,000. That's an extra 120,000. So now we're at $200,000 extra profit. That you, you see what I'm saying? By very little changes. Very little changes. And of course, accounts receivable, you got to get your money in there. I mean, uh, you know, if you if you work off of a flat fee, you need to get your money in quick as you can. If you're doing it hourly, you need to have some kind of, you know, there's different ways of doing it. I'm, and, and you know this a lot better than I do, Allison. But I would if I was doing hourly rate, I'd be getting me like a $5,000 retainer. And every time it got below 2000, they'd have to, they'd have to fill up the, mm -hmm. the coffers again. So that I don't get caught screwed over, you know? Yeah. Um, we, we highly advocate evergreen retainers. Yeah. I think, I just think you got to do that. So that's a way to do it. And so if you could do that, think about instead of being 30, 60 days out, you get your money, you know, within 10 days after you bill, you know, think about what that does to your cash flow. And then accounts payable, uh, and I'm not going to go through every one of these, but accounts payable. And this was something that I hadn't really thought about. I've always been real studious about, you know, fast pay makes fast, fast friends. You know, I got to pay my bills on time. I want a perfect credit rating and all this stuff. But uh, if you think about it, if you could get what you can negotiate with your uh, vendors that, hey, listen, I know you got 30 days, but we're going to do business. It's going to have to be 60 days. You're going to say, why? Just say, I'm trying to keep my cash flow up. So if you can hold on to that money for 30, that 30 extra days, that's more cash flow and that's, you're using that money. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so, but uh, you just saw real easily. And everybody says, well, it's not that easy, Ken. Well, it really is easy to raise your, your, your prices. It really is. Uh, I, with contingency lawyers, Everybody does a third, a third, a third. And, I, and I've talked some of my people into going to 40% and it's making like tremendous uh, impacts on their bottom line. Uh, and then if you can look at your line items and just say, we'll cut, you know, 10%, 5%, <laughs> maybe you start at 5% and then you, you know, and, and I'll go line item by line item. If this is not directly making me money, I'm getting rid of it. Bam. Uh, you know, and then what will happen too, if you do all this, if you ever get ready to sell your business, it's going to be worth so much more. <laughs> I mean, really it is because, Absolutely. you know, you know, you'll have bigger, bigger profits, you know, and then cost of sales is another one, which really is, you know, what does it cost to produce your work? That's a little harder for law firms, but you know, with, with PI cases, I say that what's the time on the desk because, the case is worth kind of what it is. It's a little different. If you do it hourly, then the deal is if you if you're billing out your paralegals, then I guess it's okay. But if you're not, then you got a problem. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you do it, Allison. But a lot of a lot of the they're, they're 
I was talking to this domestic lawyer last week and she bills out her time at 400 and her paralegal times at 150. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, man, 150. I said, well, that's great. I said, you can really get great paralegals. She said, yeah, I pay a paralegal 65,000 and right. still make really good money off of them. They're not, they're not a, they're a profit center. They're not a cost center. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it's interesting. You mentioned that I have a, a, a colleague, uh, he has a, a family, family law firm on the West coast and they're a pretty decent sized firm. I think they're up to 38 lawyers now. Oh my gosh. But ironically, his paralegal staff is twice that. And the way that his paralegals work is he has a, a system of case managers. And so essentially everything runs through the paralegal. The lawyer is almost ornamental. So the lawyer gives legal advice on a schedule and they have pre-recorded all of the types of issues that tend to come up. So you know, when your child's not being dropped off at 6.30 and it's 6.45 and you're pissed off and you want to run to court, there's a video for that. When you want to, uh, you want to negotiate more interim support before the judgment and you have not, you know, you're not satisfied with the amount that's given, here's all the, the factors that are considered, there's a video for that. So they have been able to, by virtue of scaling the paralegals who don't have malpractice insurance costs, who don't have CLE costs, who tend to earn less and a lower percentage of the total revenue stream, they have been able to create a lot more profit because there are fewer lawyers for the number of cases that you normally have to handle. So each lawyer can handle 75, 80, 90 cases because the case manager is doing all of the, the heavy lifting, if you will, and right. the lawyer is spending a lot less time per case. Now, I haven't, I, I, you know, to, be, to be candid with you all, I heard this model and I thought, uh-oh, I don't know how I feel about lawyers being excised from the process, but he's been able to make it work and he gets very, very positive reviews um, online from his clients as a result of the way that they're working because they're able to charge lower fees but still make more profit than the average domestic relations firm. Yeah, and I, th I think that's fine. I think, I think what you gotta be careful with, and I always warn lawyers about this because that is where you leverage your, your profits and, and your paralegals or your case managers. But when they start giving legal advice, you can get disbarred. Actually, a lawyer in Louisiana got disbarred for two reasons. One reason was he was paying his paralegals a percentage. <laughs> That's of, probably of, the big reason. <laughs> yeah, they, they settled their cases. And he was paying them a bonus based on what they settled. And then the other one was they were giving out legal advice. And uh, he got disbarred, had a big law firm. And they just came down on him really hard. And I thought that was kind of interesting, Louisiana, because I don't know. Every time I hear Louisiana, I think of Huey Long and and, and, and all the all the corruption back in those days. And I'm thinking, you know, I thought that's where you could get by with murder, you know, you know. But anyway, I think things change. I mean, you can get by with murder, you just can't get by with giving legal advice through a paralegal. Yeah, yeah. So I always tell, I always caution people. When we were doing it, we 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 used paralegals a lot, but we had emails going back and forth between the lawyers and that. We had a we had a pay, we had a trail, not a paper trail, but we had a digital trail in case anybody ever come in and, and, and question it because I was scared of it to be honest with you yeah. because I had a real here's the problem when you get really successful everybody comes gunning for you that's very so you true. Say, when I was just average nobody paid attention to me when I got when I was like one of the top three PI firms in the state of North Carolina I had lawyers making complaints about me every month something they make complaints about my commercials my direct mail I mean, they're just the website. That's yeah, web, yeah. I mean, they really go after you, and you know, you just have to. Got so bad, I just had to have a ethics lawyer on retainer. I mean, you know, but I mean, it was. I never got in trouble, but uh, it was always it was just another thing you had to deal with, right? That's right. The cost new, of being cost new level, of being, new devil, right? Yeah, the cost of being successful, you know. But that's just the way, you know. That, and it, People say, well, aren't you mad? I said, no. Nah. I said, they're just upset. They're not willing to do what I do because mm -hmm. they could do it. I'm not that smart. They could do it. If I could do it, they could do it. But since they're not doing it, then they, they they get jealous and they want to try to, you know, hurt me because, but eh, I never let it bother me. I just, I just, it's part of cost of doing business. And I try to do everything ethical, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's a brilliant way of looking at it. Because, you know, I think a lot of lawyers stop themselves from growing because they are so afraid of the risk associated with exactly that, right? I get too large, I become a, a moving target. Or yeah. people are going to all of a sudden start calling on me. Or I can't do that because someone's going to make a report. And I tell them, I said, listen, 
the likelihood of you getting through your legal career without getting sued, without having somebody file a grievance, without having some adversary file a, file a complaint or, or request an investigation is slim to none. If you are so safe that you are keeping yourself mediocre, sure, you increase the likelihood of that not happening. But what happens if you did maintain your mediocrity and you got that complaint? Yeah. I would rather keep my money and keep my growth and keep my status and also have to deal with the complaint than assume that I'm going to avoid that by virtue of, of hiding out. Yeah. I never got a complaint. I never got a complaint from a client. So, so, and we handled thousands of clients, but uh, the claims came from lawyers, uh, other, my competition. That was yeah. amusing, really. <laughs> All right, so I want to I wanna, uh, put a, a fine point on this conversation we're having, and, and I love that we've kind of gone deeper into the weeds of, of a lot of these topics, because you're just such a wealth of knowledge on this. But I want to talk about differentiating practice. So since we mentioned competitors, you know, those people out there that are uh, thinking that they're doing what we're doing, but they're not doing it as well, and they're doing their own version of it. Like, how do you really take your law practice and differentiate it so that people don't see you as a commodity, but they see you as the choice versus someone else? Yeah. Well, well, you know, Dan, you, you talked about Dan Kennedy. I mean, he's the one who taught me about unique selling proposition. It's the differentiator. And, and it's, I think it's one of the hardest things I teach. It's the hardest thing for lawyers to grab hold of. It, it, it is complicated. It is a little bit hard because... Here's what our lawyers say. We all do the same thing. How can I differentiate myself? But you can. Uh, and, and, and so here, here's why you want to do it. When somebody's looking for a lawyer, they got two questions in the top of their head. Do I need a lawyer? And if I do need a lawyer, why in the hell do I need you over everybody else? Why should I pick you? Because they all, they're all up there saying the same thing. We're tough. We're aggressive. We care. Free consultation. Da, da, da. Everybody's looking the same and they're getting all these messages. But what you got to do is you got to stand out from that. And it's usually with a benefit. And it could be, you know, there's a process. There's actually a book. I can't, let me see if I can find a book because it really is a good book. It gives you 10 different methods of how to figure this out for your law firm. It's by a guy named Baudry, B-O-D-R-I. It's on Amazon, uh, but it's, uh, it, there's, I like, there's three methods I like. And so when I was trying to figure out mine, I never said we got the best settlements. I never said that we, we were the best lawyers. What I said was this, no lawyer can ethically guarantee you results and neither can we, but we can and we do guarantee you that if you're not completely satisfied the way we treat you in your case, first 30 days, you can get your file, no fees, no costs. Now we could do that because we were a PI firm and we were doing that. And when I did that, everybody thought I was crazy that you just, you know, you're gonna have people go in there and get their, but get their, get their case worked on and then take their case and go settle it. Uh, I did that, I lost two cases in seven years. My, 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 my intakes, my cases with the same amount of money went up 23% uh, by changing that one thing on my ads. Uh, you know, and we were all about client service, uh, you know, and we had a, and so we didn't just talk it. We had a client, uh, 800, free 800 client advocate hotline. If anybody was upset about any lawyer, any staff, they could call it, went right to my office manager. Uh, we had a client bill of rights. Um, uh, so we did things that, uh, and we had our guarantee. And so I know it'd be hard for a domestic lawyer to do it. And then, and then the other things is, you know, like domestic lawyers, you could say, I'm only going to represent women or I'm only going to represent men or I'm, you know, and I've seen some as, you know, uh, you know, the, uh, the the UIs is what we do, and that's all we do. You know that kind of differentiates yourself. But you got to figure it out. I've seen lawyers that work with the insurance department before. And I say, you know, we know the secrets. We know the inside secrets. You know, a former defense lawyer, you know, shares the secrets. You know, if you've been a former prosecutor, you know, if you're going to do criminal work, you know, or you can have a book that could be your differentiator. You know, I, I did books too. Uh, and I use those as, you know, this is a differentiator. This guy wrote a book on it. So he must really know what he's talking about, right? But, but it is so important because what you want to do, if you, when you ever you compete on price, you're always going to lose. Look at Kmart, okay? They're gone. Look at, look at uh, Radio, uh, Radio Shack. 
Look at Circuit City. Look at look at uh, Blockbuster. Anytime you try to go on price, uh, you're going to get killed because there's always going to be somebody that'll go lower than you. So you never want to com com compete on price. And you've always got to answer that question. Why should I pick you? What is the benefit? You know, and then we can talk about Timex, you know, keeps it takes a lick, it keeps on ticking. Federal Express, when it absolutely has to got to be there. You know, that's what everybody uses. Domino's Pizza, 30 minutes or less. You know, that was that was differentiators, although Domino's had to stop that because of lawsuits by us lawyers. <laughs> uh, you know, but, but, the, but the deal is, uh, you know, and then you can, and everybody says, we do the same thing. Well, why don't you take something that everybody's doing and claim it? Uh, Slit Spear did that back in the 60s. Uh, guy went in there and said, well, what, you're steam cleaning the bottles. He said, yeah, everybody does that. He said, well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, he said, that's just part of the process. So they ran a big campaign on that. They uh, had, you know, steam clean bottles for the beer, you know, and their, their sales went up 23% for like five years. And it was something everybody else was doing, but they claimed it. So there might be something you're doing and everybody does, but you can claim it. And if you claim it first, then you own it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's the way I look at but it. But it is hard. I'm not going to lie about it. I've, I've worked with a lot of lawyers on that over the years, and, and it's probably the hardest thing to do, uh, I think. I mean, maybe it's easy for you, Allison, but I found it to be very hard. For, for, it was hard for me in my law firm because what I did, I did the method where you call people up, like 100 of your best past clients, and ask them, like 10 questions, you know, the thing I love about your law firm is this, the thing that your law firm does that no other law firm is this, you know, and ask them these type of questions. And then, and that's how we came up with our client service because what happened was they said, you know, you guys, it will never was about the money with y'all. It was always about putting us first. You always worried about us. And that was our little tagline, which is different than a USB. It was always putting you first. And that was like our tagline on top of our client service guarantee which was our usb and uh you know and then we did the other stuff i talked about but yeah, i think that's the key to it, it. it it's definitely not easy uh, no i don't think it is i mean I, I think it's hard one of the things i think is probably the greatest barrier for lawyers is they are so busy trying to be like everyone else right they look at who is most successful and then they try to copy and paste and lawyers are always asking. I see it, you know, in Facebook groups online. I see it in, in community chat when we were out and about in the public domain. You get together and say, oh, well, who are you using for this? And what are you doing for that? And they spend so much time trying to be like everybody else that the one thing that differentiates you, which is who you are, doesn't show up. You just get this cookie cutter, you know, pasted version of someone else. And then you look like a commodity because that's what you're trying to make yourself into. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my big deal was that you, if you listen to my voice, you can tell I mean, I'm an old country bumpkin. You know, I was raised in the country. And I've never tried to be anything other than what I am. And actually, that was a selling point for me because I used to do commercials. And I said, you know, we, we don't talk the old legal mumbo jumbo. I mean, we're going to talk to you in straight English, you know, and you're going to understand when you talk to our lawyers. They're going to explain to you stuff that you can understand. You know, and I'm like, you know, and, and people like that. I mean, you know, because believe it or not, people are intimidated by lawyers. Yeah. It would be like you trying to go figure out if you were going to have somebody said, you got to have brain surgery, Allison. Well, well how are you going to pick your brain surgery? <laughs> I mean, it's a big decision and you're going to be intimidated, you know, and it's going to be a hard, hard decision. And so your question is going to be, I guess I need the brain surgery. I've got two doctors telling me, but, but how do I choose? Why should I choose this one over the other three? I mean, I don't, I mean, you know, that's, is it because he's got the best success rate because he knows the newest techniques? I mean, these are the things that, you know, and, and we're, we're thinking more high level because of brain surgery. Maybe that won't a good example, but the deal is, you know, it could be even for getting your cat, your, your cat washed. I mean, why am I going to pick this one over that? Maybe you don't care if you don't love your cat, maybe you don't care, but if you really love your cat, you want them treated by somebody that's going to treat them nice and look after them and, you know, what's going to be the differentiator? Who, who are you going to pick? Uh, that is the big question you got to answer because let me tell you, and, and I tell lawyers, this is the biggest mistake I see in marketing. You should never put the word I, we, us, in anything you do because they don't care about you. Right. They really don't care about you. They What's in it for them? 
You know, that's what they will. I mean, and we're the same way. Everybody's that way. Everybody's selfish. You know, when you, no matter what it is, we're all the same. We're, we're built the same way. What's in it for me? And, and I see, so when you're making your, you know, that's a whole nother, we could speak five hour. I've, I've, I've taught five hour courses on how to, how to create ads. And, and the deal is it's, it's, there's a lot to it, but the, but the bottom line is you got to, it's all about them. It's nothing about you, you know, and if you can set your stuff up like that, you're going to be a lot more successful because they, they really don't give a shit about you. I'm sorry. <laughs> And that is, I think, a perfect place for us to put a pin in this. This has been a great conversation. I really appreciate having you on the podcast. You're always such a wealth of information. PILMA is a high-quality, high-success organization that helps lawyers to grow law firms. And we're going to put a lot of information about that in the show notes. So I want to give you an opportunity for any person who's listening that doesn't already know you and already know how to reach you. How could they do that if they want to reach out and learn more about your organization? Okay. Well, PILMA's P I. L M M A like man, uh, powerful, innovative legal marketing and management association. Uh, it's.org. And, uh, my email is Ken K E N at Pilma.org. Uh, our number is 800-497-1890. And, uh, you know, uh, we're here to help, uh, you know, and see what, you know, give us a call if we can't help. You know, everything I do, Allison, uh, and, and I'm a little different, but I, I think I picked it up from my law practice. I guarantee everything I do. If you don't, anything we sell, anything we, I, I got a hundred percent money back guarantee, you know, um, all our events, all our coaching programs, all our membership programs, all our products, you know, I just, my, my bottom line is I don't want you money. If, if I don't think, if you don't think I'm helping you, why, why would I want that? All you're going to do is talk pure trash about me and I don't want that I mean you know if I give you money back maybe you will just tell two or three people because we know that but I, I used to tell my my staff that if we do a great job they're going to tell one or two people if, if they are upset with us they're going to tell 20. <laughs> and nowadays they're going to post it online and they're yeah. going to share the post <laughs> yeah yeah now they're going to put it on Yelp Facebook <laughs> Google Plus yeah everywhere yeah that's true but I, this is back before we even had all that. And I tell my people, they, you know, if they love us, they're going to tell one to two people. And if, if they do anything, they just don't like us. They're going to tell 20 to 25. Because people like to share bad news for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> well, very true. But luckily, we are not about sharing bad news here on the podcast. We're all about bringing resources to those of us that have solo and small law firms. So I want to thank you again, Ken Hardison, for your great wealth of information and for those of you that are listening, thank you again for tuning in to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. I am Allison Williams, your law firm mentor, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Crushing Chaos with Law Firm Mentor podcast. To learn more about today's guest and take advantage of the resources mentioned, check out our show notes. And if you own a solo or small law firm and are looking for guidance, advice, or simply support on your journey to create a law firm that runs without you, join us in the Law Firm Mentor Movement free Facebook group. There, you can access our free trainings on improving collections in law firms, meeting billable hours, and join the movement of thousands of law firm owners across the country who want to crush chaos in their law firms and make more money. I'm Allison Williams, your law firm mentor. Have a great day.